appreciate the opportunity to join all of you today. We have some slides that I think are going to be showing up on your screens and just want to run through uh, some of the facts behind uh, kind of the science and data and what the, what the Biden administration is pushing right now. Uh, so number one, why are we here today? If you look on your screens, you'll see where uh, President Biden is talking about trying to revitalize the energy industry, trying to build a, uh, uh, empowering American workers and businesses based upon these new technologies. Specifically, some of the executive orders uh, cover things like trying to reduce emissions, trying to improve access to energy resources, trying to improve the affordability and reliability of energy. Um, and you can see the executive orders that have been issued so far, things like revoking the Keystone Pipeline, banning or pausing offshore energy production, as well as production on federal lands, in some cases, even rescinding previously approved permits for oil and gas activities. Uh, they also are working to uh, remove what they call subsidies, which is, is, is largely just regular tax treatment for businesses associated with oil and gas production. Now, it's important that we understand what the current state of energy is. Uh, right now, if you look at what we're doing out of Louisiana, and this isn't out of, out of the nation, this is out of Louisiana, we're exporting energy to 36 states, uh, excuse me, 36 countries around the world out of Louisiana. We're exporting oil to 12 different countries out of Louisiana. This is a huge industry for us. It's an opportunity. It's economic activity. It's helping to address the trade deficit. And of course, importantly, it's providing jobs and income for many families across uh, Louisiana. So if you, look at this, if you look at this chart, you'll see on the far right, we actually crossed over, not just into energy independence, but net exports in energy last year. Another fact that many people don't fully appreciate, today the United States spends more money on energy research and development than any other country in the world. Okay, I'm going to say that again. We spend more money on energy research and development than any other country in the world, and not just any other country, than every other country in the world combined. The United States is truly setting the standard. It's not just about, about investing dollars, as you can see in that uh, chart there on the bottom. What that shows is it shows the amount of electricity we're producing, which is the orange or red line, and then it shows the amount of emissions, which is the blue line. So, so showing you the outcome of this, of this investment, we're producing more electricity with lower emissions. The last time Congress tried to step in and force or direct emissions reduction, it was known as Waxman-Markey. If you look at the chart on the left, you can see that the cost of energy, uh, which is the projected cost, which is the gray line in the middle, that's what was projected to be energy costs moving forward. The red or orange line is what was projected to be the increased cost attributable to Waxman-Markey regulating greenhouse gas emissions. And in reality, we did not pass the law. We let technology and innovation take over, and look at what happened. We reduced emissions more by not regulating. I'm going to say that again. We reduced emissions more by not regulating. On the right side, similar outcome with prices, the projected cost uh, under Waxman-Markey, and the projected um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I've got it backwards. The left side is the cost, the right side is the emissions. So on the right side, once again, lower emissions uh, as a result of not regulating the markets. Today, as a matter of fact, the United States is the global leader in reducing emissions. We have reduced emissions more than any other country in the world, but once again, Mr. Chairman, it's not just about reducing emissions more than every other country. It's more than the next 12 emissions-reducing countries combined. All right, so think about that. More than the next 12 emissions-reducing countries combined, that's what the United States has done. And this shows you what our leadership looks like compared to other countries, UK, Italy, Ukraine, Spain, Japan, France, Germany, all of these other countries, we're reducing more. The, the director of the International Energy Agency said that what the United States has done over the last 10 years is the greatest reduction in history of uh, energy. Uh, so extraordinary efforts. Now, here's what's happening. You've, you, everybody appreciates the whole balloon scenario. You squeeze a balloon, it pops out on the sides. What this, what this shows is on the right side in particular, while the United States is reducing emissions, China is going completely in the opposite direction. They are increasing emissions, and under the Paris Accords, this climate agreement that, that President Biden has re-engaged in, China not only has increased emissions, but they will be allowed to increase emissions another 50 percent through 2030. Um, uh, as the United States has reduced emissions, every one ton of emissions we've reduced, China has increased by four. If this is a global problem, this is doing absolutely nothing 
for the globe other than creating dirtier air. Here's another reason why U.S. energy, specifically Louisiana energy, has to be a key to, to our energy future. Right now, you can look at our, at our regulatory environment. U.S. natural gas, for example, has somewhere between a 41 to 47 percent lower emissions profile. Speaking another way, for every one cubic foot of, of, of Russian gas that we displace or supplant, we are reducing emissions by somewhere around uh, 42 percent. So, so the more U.S. gas we export, the lower global emissions, not to mention we're displacing uh, Russia's aggressive military and foreign affairs activity, activity all over the globe that are challenging U.S. interests around the globe and those of our allies. Similarly, with Chinese coal, U.S. coal has a 33 percent lower emissions profile. Once again, the more U.S. coal we export, the lower global emissions we see. Um, uh, here's another just amazing statistic. President Obama put something called a clean power plan in place. And what he did is he said, we're going to reduce emissions by 35 percent of a 2005 baseline by 2030. President Trump came in and said, no, 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 we're not doing this. He threw it out. Guess what? As a result of American innovation, we reduced emissions by 2019, hitting that, that target that President Obama had, had intended for us to hit by 2030. Uh, again, American innovation, allowing markets to do what they do, technology neutral, we've exceeded even the Obama administration's objectives. Here's an example of what a clean energy future looks like. This is called Net Power. It's a plant in Houston that produces natural gas-fired electricity, using something called the alarm cycle. They inject oxygen. They have carbon sequestration project. It results in natural gas electricity, market prices, zero emissions. Many people have identified oil and gas, what we have abundantly in Louisiana, as being the enemy. The reality is it's the emissions that are causing the problem. And, and, and many people, including in the Biden administration, can't separate that. If we can continue to use oil and gas, which have 30 times the energy density of the next closest renewable, and we can capture the emissions, why in the world would we throw this out? It doesn't make any sense. Something that's really important to us here at home, Louisiana, as a result of your activities and the PSC and others, we have the lowest electricity rates in America. Louisiana has the lowest electricity rates in America. You can see a few states on here looking at what other states are doing. You have, that have embraced these aggressive climate change policies like being enacted by the current administration, their electricity rates are double or in some cases triple what we pay at home. Why in the world would we want to replicate that? I have no idea. Years, a few years ago up in New England, Massachusetts specifically, they, they did not have the natural gas supply because they got rid of their gas pipelines or refused to install them. So what did they do when they needed more heat? They burned home heating oil, greater emissions. They then didn't have enough of that. So you know what they did? They turned to Vladimir Putin to bring in Russian liquefied natural gas. No kidding, into the ports up in Massachusetts, offloaded it, and that's how they, they heated the homes there. So, so the alternative, if you're going to go aggressive on, on these climate change renewable policies, is we can become increasingly dependent upon Russia, greater emissions. Vladimir Putin was literally tweeting, teasing the United States about the fact that he had to come save them. Similarly, Similarly, in California, uh, the state of California has been very aggressive about uh, 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 implementing climate policies as well. California is the most dependent state in America on imported energy. The most dependent state in America. They've reduced emissions. Uh, they're the 43rd uh, best state in the country in terms of reducing emissions, or about the eighth worst in the country in terms of reducing emissions. Uh, that's what California's done. Once again, rates are approximately double that of Louisiana, and, um, and, and they, they're, they're not achieving the next one. Um, all right, great, thanks. Um, so 43rd among states in reducing emissions over the last 10 years. Electricity rates are double those of Louisiana, the highest net importer of electricity or energy, uh, including the, the majority of it coming from Saudi Arabia. And they have lawsuits from uh, economically distressed groups, uh, the, the, the lower income groups, because of their policies causing higher, 
heating and cooling bills. And so look, this isn't my opinion. This is what the facts show, what history shows. As a result of these executive orders, we're gonna see higher electricity prices, higher cost of fuel, our, uh, our, our cars. We're gonna see lost revenue sharing for coastal restoration, hurricane protection, and um, flood control. We're gonna see higher delivery costs. And I wanna make note, less safe delivery costs because we're gonna be importing more energy, more dependence upon energy supply chains from China, Iran, Iraq, Russia, Nigeria, and other countries and a net increase in global emissions because these countries have higher emissions profiles than our energy does. This is going to result in, according to API, 50,000 job losses in the energy sector in Louisiana. You think I'm making this up? Look back during the Obama administration. They did well control rule. They did methane rule. They did financial assurance. Um, all of these death by a thousand cuts, the social cost of carbon, and what happened? We lost one third of the energy jobs in Louisiana. We were able to get some of those back. And, 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 and we're headed, unfortunately, in the wrong direction again. As history has shown, when you decrease production, you don't decrease demand for those energy supplies. You simply address the delta from imported energy. Why we wouldn't produce it in Louisiana versus Russia, I have no idea. We're going we're to become more dependent upon foreign energy sources and technologies. It, it's the wrong direction. For example, in 2006, the U.S. produced about 8% of the global supply of solar panels. China produced 15%, 8% to 15% in 2006. In 2017, China is producing, was producing 70% of the solar panels. So we're migrating from a Louisiana-dominant, U.S.-dominant energy source, oil and gas, to one where we're going to be dependent upon Asia. It's the wrong direction. Not only are we going to be dependent upon them for the panels, this shows some of the, 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 the rare earth and strategic minerals, like um, uh, some of the oxides and metals. China has a monopoly on these strategic minerals in Asia and in Africa. Uh, this is how you build batteries and other technologies. They know what they're doing. They're thinking forward. It undermines our economic security, our national security. Um, the direct impact on Louisiana in regard to revenue sharing, as you know, the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act shares revenues from offshore energy production with the state of Louisiana. Last year, uh, uh, CPRA Chairman Chip Klein picked up a check for approximately $156 million. I don't know what he did with it, but, um, uh, but, but $156 million was just last year. By, by decreasing this production, you are decreasing investments in coastal restoration and hurricane protection. Look, in closing, I just want to say that if you look at U.S. leadership, the facts and the data show that by producing energy here, you create jobs, you have cleaner energy, you reduce global emissions, we have revenues for our coastal restoration, hurricane protection, and flood control efforts. These are all wins. When you depend upon these other countries, you, you, you lose all of those things. You lose the jobs, you lose the economic activity, and you, um, and, you, and you result in greater global emissions. So U.S. energy policy needs to focus on our assets. If you're the CEO of a company, you look at what your strengths are, you look at what your resources are, and you build a plan based upon that. This plan is built upon the, 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 the strategic advantages of other countries. Think for just a minute, Mr. Chairman, if when LSU was winning the national championship undefeated, if somebody came out and said, you know what, we're going to go ahead and switch out Coach O and Joe Burrow. Can you imagine what the public would have said? Can you imagine the response? What would you have said? I mean, to think about that for just a minute. We are leading the world. We are leading the world, and we're doing it with our assets, our resources, and you're talking about a plan that would come in and totally pivot when evidence shows it would result in worse environmental, worse economic outcomes. It's the wrong direction. So looking forward to working with you all, working with Congressman Higgins and, and our delegation to ensure that we can show the data, show the facts, and, and, and push energy uh, policy in a direction that actually represents the, uh, Louisiana's interest and America's interest moving forward. So, thank you. Would you mind uh, taking a question? Absolutely. Thank you. Senator Allen uh, would like to ask you, but he's going to come to the well. Congressman Graves, thank you so much for, for being engaged in this. Uh, my question is, is more of a down-home uh, uh, question for Louisiana. I mean, I've, I've been on budget committees here since, since I got here. Uh, GOMESA, which, which you were instrumental in getting passed, which increased our revenue share of, of offshore revenues, was the source of what we were going to use to restore our coast. You touched on it briefly. But without these funds, with, with, without, with the Biden administration taking the knees out of, of this fund source, number one, how are we going to restore our coast 
And number two, the $1.4 billion that the federal government says we owe them for the fortification of, of the levees below New Orleans after Katrina, you know, they spent $14 billion and they, and they sent us a bill for a $1.2 or $1.4 billion. Go Mesa was also going to be a revenue source to repay that. So how they expect us to, to restore our coast and pay them back for the levees that, that were built in New Orleans uh, if we don't have the revenue source to do it? Uh, Senator, uh, it's, a, it's a really good point. I, I noted earlier that $156 million was the check last year. We expected in the future for that number to go up. We have been working in both the House and Senate, Congressman Richmond and I, uh, as well as Senator Cassidy, working on legislation to increase the future shares for Louisiana. We've passed it through committees in the past uh, on a bipartisan basis. Um, so there's no doubt this kneecaps our coastal program in Louisiana. And, and the short-sightedness of it, Senator, is that when you look back, I mean, it, there are all sorts of studies that show for every $1 you invest through CPRA's program, the master plan, you, you receive a, a, on the low end somewhere around $4 for, in cost savings for every $1 you invest. On the high end, they've been able to demonstrate 12 to even $16 in savings for $1 being invested. So, so not only are you stopping the restoration, the resiliency of our coastal communities, you also are going to result in greater federal expenditures in the future through FEMA and other disaster agencies. Offshore revenues are the second highest source of revenue for the U.S. Treasury behind taxes. And so this isn't just limited to restoration. This is your transportation programs, your environmental programs, your health care programs, your education. All of these things are going to be lost. And where is this revenue going? It's going to higher energy prices, largely to overseas energy supply lines. It, it really is based on facts and data. It's the wrong direction in regard to the payback of the hurricane protection system in the five parishes around the New Orleans area. It, it certainly does contribute to the to the financial problems uh, paying that back and uh, we're gonna we're gonna continue to be working to push against this but look something that's 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 really important to understand even the messaging the front page of the newspaper around the United States saying that that Biden bans oil and gas that puts a huge chill effect on investment and and I don't expect them to come out and say we're stopping all oil and gas it is gonna be death by a thousand cuts this whole social cost of carbon concept I mean that is the the, the most uh, arbitrary mechanism to try and count or quantify the cost of, of different regulatory actions, they're going to kill the energy industry indirectly, but, but as a result of what they're trying to do. So it is critical that we stand up and, and, and show how the, the facts, the data, the science show a different direction as being the best solution. Thank you, Senator Allah. Uh, Representative Mincy, do you have a question for the Congressman? Good morning, Congressman. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your continued leadership in uh, D.C., and thank you for being with us today. Your presence alone shows your commitment to this issue as well as commitment to our state. So thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. um, you've always been a champion for coastal pro uh, protection, restoration, and flood protection, and you, we spoke a little bit about those executive orders and how it's going to affect us. Specifically, can you elaborate any on how this would affect us from like the Morganza to the Gulf and also the, and the, the code meeting in the capital region area? Uh, absolutely. Um, so, Representative Mincy, uh, right now the Morganza to the Gulf project, it is uh, the, the largest uh, Corps of Engineers project in, in the nation. The authorization on it is somewhere around $14 billion. The entire National Corps of Engineers backlogs just under $100 billion. So, so this is a huge part of that of that uh, backlog and, and, and the offshore energy revenues. And look, while Go Mesa, the energy revenue sharing is a big part of it, keep in mind, this is the revenue stream, the taxes for the parishes. Uh, this is what funds, quite frankly, the Coastal Trust Fund is funded from energy production. Uh, that, that's how they, they fund their operating budget. And so you are going to see a huge chill effect, not just on the ability to fund capital projects like uh, Morganza to the Gulf or, or moving forward on some of the other capital region projects we're working on, enhancements to uh, the Comet project, concepts like, and I know it, 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 it's got some problems, but concepts like the Darlington Reservoir, uh, the resources will not be there for, for those types of projects. And so, um, you know, we, we connected long ago or established a relationship between energy production, oil and gas production, and, and um, uh, our, our resiliency of our coastal communities and communities all over South Louisiana uh, under the state's constitution. 
every penny of the revenues that are received go into the, the flood control, the hurricane protection, and the coastal restoration efforts in the state. And so by, by stopping the production, you stop the revenue stream. We're already projecting a decrease for this year uh, as a result below the $156 million we received last year. So, so it ends up uh, being a, really a, a backward strategy because it's going to result in higher federal expenditures picking up the pieces as we saw uh, in 2016 from the flood that occurred in your region. And so this really is a backwards policy. It doesn't achieve any of the objectives in terms of emissions, cost, reliability, any of it. And, and, and it has further impacts like the, the, the flood control, hurricane protection, and coastal restoration in Louisiana. Thank you very much. Yes, Thank you, Representative Mincy. Senator Hewitt, we have two more questions for you, Congressman, and then you're off the hook. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Congressman, for your leadership on this issue. You know, two years ago, I was with you at the Capitol, at the U.S. Capitol, at your invitation to testify before a U.S. subcommittee. And as you recall, what was being considered at that time was legislation that was going to stop uh, seismic activity and leasing activity in the Gulf and the Atlantic and the Pacific and the Arctic. And we talked about all, a, a lot of these same topics that now it appears what they couldn't do legislatively two years ago, Biden is trying to do through executive order. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that, one of the most compelling facts that, um, that we talked about at that hearing and that I presented on a slide was looking at the supply and demand forecast from the International Energy Agency. And if you remember, it showed a 20-year forecast, the, the, uh, the demand for energy and the supply forecast for 20 years. So the supply showed a definite growth in solar and wind and renewable energies. And, and then fossil fuels had to make up the gap. And fossil fuels, they said at that time, in 2040 was going to have to be 50 percent of the world's energy to meet the demand. And so my question is, I mean, that didn't come from, from us or from API or any oil and gas entity. This is the International Energy Agency's forecast. So how can the Biden administration decide to chop off the knees of the oil and gas industry when clearly there is a huge need for them to continue to supply a significant amount of the world's energy. And so I, my, my ask of you, and I don't expect you to be able to speak for the administration, sure. but have you seen any evidence or any forecast? I mean, they talk about, let's base it on the science and the facts. I don't understand how you can chop off one source of energy when the other ones are not ready to step up to the plate and fill the gap. Yeah. Um, Senator, you, you made an excellent point. I want to thank you again for coming to testify before our, our committee. So, you know, let, let's, let's hit two things here. So, number one, let's be clear. I think that all of us support renewable energy. We have a big wind, uh, excuse me, solar farm that was uh, built over in West Baton Rouge, uh, down in St. Charles Parish, Valero, and Darling Ingredients are doing this green diamond diesel, uh, using 100% renewable diesel from plants, from animal renderings, and other things that you can interchange with regular diesel. 75% of it's going to California. They're going to be building another uh, green diesel project in West Baton Rouge. Uh, these are all great when they make economic sense, and they're going to continue to play a role in our energy future. But it is also very clear with those intermittent sources like wind and solar, you've got to have the base load like natural gas, nuclear, and others to, to supply. You're exactly right that looking forward, that, that, that energy demand, I mean, keep in mind some, some countries around the world, they don't even have energy. And, and energy demand, is, as transmission lines grow and develop, occurs, energy demand is going to increase in an extraordinary way. The, the, the natural gas plays the largest role in, 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 in addressing the energy demands around the globe today. And to take that away, you do not have the development or the deployment capability to put renewables in those spots. It, it's impossible. And so you're exactly right. This is just a, a strategy. And, and look, I want to be clear, this isn't political. This is just data. This is black and white numbers that show what's happened historically, what's going to happen moving forward if we continue down this path. It's not in the U.S. interest. And uh, ju just to give you one example, example of, of how you've got to think through some of these solutions a little bit better. If we try, as, as some people in Congress have, to try to require electric vehicles uh, across the board, universal application of electric vehicles, you're going to have to triple or maybe even quadruple electricity generation. 
Our current transmission system, our, even though we have two nuclear power plants in Louisiana and other facilities, we cannot, we cannot generate it, we can't trans, uh, transmit it. it. These are fundamental problems and, and, and everybody, it's like the, operating on blind faith and just moving in this, this religious direction of renewable energy without thinking about practically how you do it, how you lay out the strategy and steps and the implications on Louisiana and the rest of the country, which of course are adverse. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Hewitt. Senator Connick. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Congressman. Good to see you again. You uh, without a doubt, the, the, the change in the administration has caused the, the crippling of this industry. What is the reasoning? What is what is the uh, what is the what is the president saying about what's happening in Louisiana? What's the, is there a solution? Uh, or does he not care? Or can we can we reverse some of this? Um, so so let's keep in mind there were dozens of executive orders that were written and, and that were released. I think written before, but were released in just the first few days of the administration. So I think these things had had been on the shelf. They were ready to go. Um, and I think that this was really signaling, and, and, and I think virtue signaling in some cases, and, and having the chill effect on investment in the industry. I think it's adding fuel to this, this ESG concept, environmental and social governance concept you're seeing uh, uh, take off across Wall Street. Um, so I, I, I don't think that they're, they're truly thinking about what is the outcome economically and otherwise? I think that this was, you know, sort of this this uh, ideology that many folks on the on the more liberal side have. I think that they they believe that this is the right thing, but but it's sort of it's sort of we're here and they're looking at this, uh, you know, sort of unicornish uh, objective over here and not thinking about the practical implications or the steps to get there. Um, you know, as I, as I said, I think that their objectives are reducing emissions, creating jobs, increasing access to affordable energy, uh, boosting uh, uh, energy, um, uh, the, the economy, and, and improving the reliability of U.S. energy. But, but when you start going through and looking at their strategic steps forward, you, you actually undermine every single one of those goals. And so I'm hopeful that as we move forward and they get their administration stood up, we're able to show them just, just from a, a science perspective and from a historical perspective what happens when you do these things and the outcomes are very different than what they're trying to achieve. And I'll give you an example. I've repeatedly offered amendments to legislation, climate legislation that said, yes, you can do all these things. You can require solar, you can require electric cars and all these things, except, except if these policies would result in greater global emissions because people are moving their operations to China, India, Mexico, and less efficient countries in regard to emissions. So, so if it results in greater global emissions, then you can't do this. And do you know that every single time I've offered that amendment, they have, the people, the sponsors of the bill have opposed my amendment. They know, they know that this results in greater emissions. I've offered amendments that have said, if this is gonna increase the cost of electricity and have a disproportionate impact on our impoverished community members, um, then this would not go into effect. You know that they voted against it every single time. And, and I could go on and on, net job loss, economic activity being sent overseas, affecting the trade deficit. Every single time they oppose my amendments that, 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 that demonstrate how their objectives are actually undermined by the legislation that they're pushing. 